Hi, my name is Sarah Fredrickson. I'm a clinical dietitian at Norton Women's and Children's Hospital, and today we're going to be talking about stroke prevention through dietary changes. So really overall, we're going to be talking about small lifestyle modifications, dietary modifications that we can make um, that are a sustainable way to live that we can practice for a long time and aren't going to affect our quality of life too much as far as eating goes, but are going to be really beneficial in the long run. So first we're going to talk about our objectives. Um, so knowing the stroke disease process is important because we need to know what the foods that we're eating, how they're going to change, how they're going to affect our body. We're also going to talk about risk factors for having a stroke, um, who's a candidate for a heart healthy diet, the types of fat, unsaturated fat versus saturated fat. We're also going to talk about cholesterol um, and then labs that are viewed when a patient's on this diet. So there's a lot of different types of cholesterol. Um, there's triglycerides and it can be kind of confusing to know what those different lab values mean and what those numbers are supposed to be. So we'll go over some different tables that have those lab values that you can reference um, when you do get your lipid panels done or any types of labs. We're also going to talk about sodium and how to reduce that in the diet and some foods that that is commonly high in. We're also going to talk about fiber and how we can increase that in the diet and foods that that is high in. Um, finally, we're going to talk about the dietary guidelines, which are pretty much just general healthy eating guidelines that we recommend for pretty much anyone, um, and also eating out guidelines, which not that we're doing too much of that nowadays, but it's still good to know. So starting off with the disease process of a stroke, it's really important to know this, like I said, so we can um, think about, okay, this food that I'm eating, how is this affecting my body? How can this potentially contribute to having a stroke? So as you can see, a stroke is when an artery becomes blocked. Um, and what causes that blockage is plaque buildup, as you can see. Um, in the second picture, the plaque is slightly built up, but in the third one, the artery is extremely narrow and um, it's difficult for the blood to even pass through. So an ischemic stroke is the, the blocked artery that I just discussed. So when that plaque fully um, blocks off the artery and blood can no longer flow. Um, a hemorrhagic stroke is when a blood vessel bursts. So um, that plaque would be sort of blocking the artery, but then the blood vessel would burst as a result of that. Um, and then you might have heard of a trans ischemic attack, a TIA. It's most similar um, to the ischemic attack is a blocked artery, but it doesn't have the long-term effects of a stroke. Um, and then what causes the blockage overall is the plaque buildup. And so this plaque is the result of fatty foods that we've eaten, um, like waxy cholesterol. Um, even some calcium deposits can harden the plaques. So really, even sometimes when I'm eating uh, like fatty food, I think, oh my goodness, this is contributing to the plaques in my arteries. So it's good just to know um, what you're eating, how it's affecting your body. And the, some processes that contribute to this is um, atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of plaque. That's just the name for that process. Um, and then arteriosclerosis is what happens when your arteries harden and they become very stiff. So not only um, is the artery occluded and blood can't really go through, but the artery is also very stiff. So there's really no room um, for blood to expand in any way, which leads to a stroke. Um, so next we're going to talk about the risk factors for a stroke. So being overweight or obese, physically inactive, just having a general sedentary lifestyle, which has been really common for a lot of people um, these days lately. Um, heavier binge drinking, that just contributes to a lot of excess calories and can result in food that's just not very nutrient dense. Also having a high blood pressure. Um, cigarette smoking or secondhand smoke exposure can also be a risk factor for stroke. Having high cholesterol, like we said, those waxy, um, that waxy cholesterol can also contribute to plaques. Um, diabetes or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and OSA is also kind of tied in with obesity. Usually if you have one, you tend to have the other. Um, cardiovascular disease is different heart conditions. So any kind of um, heart defect, heart failure, like congestive heart failure, um, an infection or AFib, so an abnormal heart rhythm. Those are, um, the heart is already impacted by those. So the plaques just make it even more difficult for blood to pass through. Um, and then a personal or family history of stroke, heart attack, or the trans attack, the TIA, like we talked about earlier. 
And then who is a candidate for a heart healthy diet? It's pretty much anyone. Um, it's never going to be a bad thing to eat in a heart healthy way. So patients with a high blood cholesterol, which would be a cholesterol over 200, it's going to be extremely beneficial to eat a heart healthy diet that's low in fat, low in sodium, low in cholesterol. Um, also patients with a high blood pressure, the heart is just working so hard to pump blood through these occluded vessels. Um, and so if your blood pressure is over 130 to 80, um, 130 over 80, then you're going to potentially have a, a greater risk for stroke and then you would want to practice this heart healthy diet. Um, and then also patients with an excess body weight. So that would be tracked by a BMI, which is the ratio of your height and weight. And you can just Google a BMI calculator and plug in your height and weight. It's really just a general recommendation of what weight you should be according to your height. Um, and it differs by gender. Um, let's see. And then a BMI of overweight would be 24.9 to 29.9. And then a BMI of obese is 30 um, and above. And there's different classes once you hit 30 and above. Okay, so now we're going to start getting into the components of the diet, beginning with the types of fat. Um, so you might have heard of kind of good fat versus bad fat. And saturated fat is what we would more commonly refer to as like the bad type of fat. Um, this contributes to increasing our bad cholesterol, our LDL cholesterol, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and the way you can identify these fats is that they're solid at room temperature. So these are going to be things um, such as bacon, bacon fat that solidifies them at the room temperature, butter, um, those solid fats are generally types of saturated fats. Um, and as you can see, also red meat, cheese, eggs, um, a lot of meat, meat and animal products with saturated fat. Um, and then unsaturated fats, these are what you generally hear as the good fats. You might have heard someone saying, oh, I'm eating an avocado, that's the good fat, which is true. Um, and so these are broken down even further into polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. So polyunsaturated fats, these are things like corn, vegetable oil, um, sunflower, safflower oil, um, and safflower oil is the best choice as far as polyunsaturated fats goes. Um, and then monounsaturated fats like peanut oil, canola oil, and olive oil is the best choice of monounsaturated fats. So really any oil that you have in your pantry is going to be more beneficial than any kind of saturated fat like butter. So the more that you can implement um, liquid fats instead of solid fats, it's going to be beneficial. Either way, they're still fats, um, but if you do have to choose, unsaturated is, is the way to go. Then additionally, other sources of unsaturated fat, um, not just oils, but we have nuts and seeds, fish such as salmon or tuna, any of those kinds of fish are going to be beneficial and uh, making sure when you're buying those, if you're buying them in a can, you're um, getting ones that are packed in water and not oil, that's really important to decrease fat intake of those. Um, and then now discussing omega-3 fatty acids. You might have heard of these as well. Um, it's a type of polyunsaturated fat, and the main purpose of these is considered a heart-healthy fat, and it also contributes to decreasing inflammation. So this can be really beneficial in inflammatory conditions such as MS. Um, and it's also in different types of fish, including salmon and tuna. As you can see in this picture, is a lot of the types of polyunsaturated fats, like we discussed earlier. But these just have some added benefits. Um, and then trans fats. You might have heard of these, you might have not. Um, but they're on the ingredients list on food labels um, under partially hydrogenated oils. So on peanut butter, you might see hydrogenated palm kernel oil or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Um, and as you can see on the nutrition facts panel there, that's trans fat, two grams. Um, and what happened with trans fats is that um, people in the food production industry thought, okay, um, it'd be great if we could take the benefits of liquid fats and turn them into solid fats. That's their solid at room temperature. Um, just for culinary purposes so that we can get all the biscuits we want with um, the benefits of unsaturated fat rather than saturated fat. Um, the problem is this created a different type of bond in the chemical structure, which actually is 
um, not beneficial for our bodies at all. It's actually very harmful. Um, so this contributes to increasing LDL cholesterol um, and lowering HDL cholesterol. So we're we're increasing the bad cholesterol and we're lowering the good cholesterol by consuming trans fats. Um, and this is included in a lot of like processed foods, um, commercial baked goods, fried foods, steak margarine, um, since that's an oil that's converted to a solid. Um, but then also the FDA is starting to decrease the amount of trans fats that are allowed in products because they're so harmful. Um, so in the coming years, that should really be non-existent but it's still definitely good to monitor. Okay, so ways to reduce fat in the diet. We're gonna to wanna to choose lean cuts of meat, um, and these are gonna be things such as boneless, skinless chicken, pork tenderloin, any meat that you can see that's lean, um, or if you're looking at the ground beef package in the store, you wanna choose lean ground beef. Um, you wanna bake your fish, not fry it. And as you can see, this chicken sandwich looks pretty good to me. Um, you're gonna wanna drain and rinse your meat after browning. So when you're cooking ground beef in the pan and you have all those, um, all the fat is kind of reduced, you're gonna wanna just drain that. Um, or bacon, you're gonna wanna drain. Um, not that that's lean meat, just an example. Um, and then also just monitor portion sizes. A portion size of meat is generally um, about three ounces and that's the size of the palm of your hand or a deck of cards. You can think of it that way, the same thickness, um, the same length and width as a deck of cards. So if you wanna think about it like that, when you're having portions of meat, it's really good to make sure you're not um, heavily intaking large um, portions of meat that contains a lot of saturated fat, a lot of cholesterol. Um, and like I said, just making small substitutions. So if you're at Chick-fil-A, maybe half the time you go, you get the grilled chicken sandwich instead of the fried chicken sandwich. Just making small changes um, to foods that you already enjoy can have a, a big impact. Um, and then cholesterol. So this is a waxy substance. Um, and humans make this from animal fat. So it's actually in our bodies as well. It's not just from food. Um, and it does have healthy functions for us. So it forms cell membranes. Um, it helps to insulate the myelin sheet that's around a lot of the fibers in our nerves. Um, but it also has unhealthy functions as well, like forming the deposits that we discussed earlier and the artery wall. So not only does fat contribute, but also cholesterol contributes to the plaques that form in our arteries. So it's really good to look at the nutrition facts label, monitor how much cholesterol you're intaking, get a lipid panel done to see what your cholesterol levels are. Um, and cholesterol is only found in animal products. So it's just a good rule of thumb if you're, if you're on a plant-based diet, if you're um, a vegetarian, you're not gonna be consuming any cholesterol because it's only in animal products. Um, that being said, just monitor. Like I said, look at the nutrition facts panel and monitor how much cholesterol you're intaking. <clears throat> For labs, um, first we're going to discuss HDL, which is more considered the good cholesterol. So what this cholesterol does is it carries cholesterol out of the blood out of the bloodstream um, and allows it to be broken down in the liver and eliminated. So it's it's kind of essentially cleaning up. It's taking all that cholesterol in our arteries. It's taking it to the liver to be removed from the body. Um, and here's some reference reference ranges. Um, in a table just so if you go get your um, lipid panel done and you see your HDL, you don't really know what that means. Um, for women, it's less than 50. Um, for men, it's less than 40. Um, and that would mean that you're at an increased risk. For HDL, we want it to be as high as possible. We don't want it to be low. Um, continuing with labs, we're looking at LDL. So this is more commonly referred to as the bad cholesterol. And what this does is it kind of creates the mess. If HDL is what comes and picks up the mess, LDL is what creates the mess because it delivers this cholesterol all throughout our bloodstream. Um, so it delivers it to the body cells, um, but it also puts those deposits in the cell walls that we talked about. So it's kind of a process that you wanna have um, a good balance going, I guess. You wanna have your LDL that's giving it to your cells, um, but if you have too much LDL, it's gonna leave deposits in your cell walls. So we have our HDL that's gonna come pick up some of that out of our arteries. 
Um, and you can see the reference ranges here as well. So you can just use this as a reference when you do get your lab values done, um, come back to this to see, are you at a high risk? Are you um, above optimal? And you know, adjust your diet based on that. Um, with labs, we're next going to talk about triglycerides, and this is a storage form of fat in the body. So this tends to be elevated when you're consuming high-fat foods, um, concentrated sweets, or alcoholic beverages. And all macronutrients, carbs, proteins, and fats, they all break down into glucose um, at some point in the body. And so whenever we have an excess of glucose, it's stored as triglycerides. So we really just want to make sure um, high-fat foods are high in calories, concentrated sweets, alcohol is all really high in calories. So um, by eliminating high-calorie foods and beverages, it's going to be very beneficial in lowering your triglycerides, and particularly those high-fat foods. Um, again, here's the reference ranges for that that you can look at when you get your cholesterol checked. Um, sodium, this is especially important if you have um, congestive heart failure. Um, a good tip is just to avoid the salt shaker and use spices instead. Um, keep the salt maybe in the kitchen, just use a little bit when you're cooking, but don't put a salt shaker on the table. Um, I think a lot of times we just put salt on our food out of habit when really we don't even taste it first to see when we sit down at the dinner table. Um, and a lot of Foods have hidden sodium that you wouldn't normally think about as being salty, um, such as canned foods. Um, there's a lot of salt added in the canning process. So if you look for canned foods, it usually has like a green label and it'll say no salt added. That's going to be the best choice um, with canned foods. Um, and then frozen foods. They want their foods to taste just as good when they're thawed as they do when they were picked. And so they add a lot of sodium to things like frozen vegetables so that they'll still taste good because um, freezing really dulls the flavor of products. Um, so things like not only frozen vegetables but frozen dinners like TV dinners, microwavable meals, those are generally extremely high in sodium. Um, also cheese, also high in sodium, tomato products, and snack foods especially. Um, so chips, crackers, anything like that. Um, and you can see from this nutrition facts panel this has 28% sodium. It's really good to look at the percent sodium. Um, a good rule of thumb is if it's below 10%, that's a good choice. You can feel free to have that. Um, if it's between 10 to 20% sodium, it's a real, it just depends. Think about, okay, how much sodium have I had the rest of the day? Did I have a really high sodium lunch? So maybe I shouldn't have this for dinner. Um, or have I eaten a lot of fruits and vegetables today? And maybe this is my um, product that I want to kind of splurge on. So it's just about balancing sodium throughout your day. Um, and is there maybe a frozen meal that is the same product, but it has um, significantly less sodium? So it's just important to monitor. And that below 10% is just a good rule. With a lot of frozen meals, it's moderately impossible to find one that's below 10%. Um, but between that 10 to 20 range is a good range to be in as well. Um, and then above 20 is kind of probably not. Uh, it's not ideal to use 20% of your daily value of sodium in a single product, let alone a single meal, um, if you think about how to balance that throughout the day. So just monitor it. Like I said, consider what else you're eating throughout the day. That's going to be really important as well. Um, fiber. Fiber has so many benefits. Um, it serves to help keep us full for long periods of time. So it increases satiety, it lowers cholesterol, it improves digestive health. Um, and so it's an indigestible form of carbohydrate. So it's in things like fruits and vegetables, um, grain products, beans and lentils. And it is only found in plants. So um, Fiber is only found in plant-based foods, such as breads, fruits, vegetables, lentils, and it has a cholesterol-lowering effect. So soluble fiber also has a cholesterol-lowering effect. Um, and as you can see in the picture, there's bananas, oats, it's really quite a wide variety of items. Um, and the goal is 14 grams of fiber per 1,000 calories. So what that evens out to is about 25 grams a day for women and 38 grams per day for men. 
So if you look at the Nutrition Facts panel, you look under Dietary Fiber, and you can track throughout the day how much fiber you're getting. Um, but these, uh, it's very easy to get in fiber. You can have a lot of substitutions, such as swapping out your white bread for wheat bread. Um, instead of um, having some chips, eat some vegetables, eat some carrots and ranch. Small little changes like that are not only going to decrease the amount of fat you're intaking, but you're also going to have the benefits of fiber. Um, so really any snack that you eat throughout the day can that can have fiber in it that's going to keep you full until your next meal is going to be highly beneficial to decrease calories as well as replacing a potentially high fat snack with something that has a lot of fiber. So how and what to eat. This is just the general healthy guidelines. So my plate, which replaced the food pyramid, um, if anyone remembers that, that's kind of the starting nutrition that I learned with the food pyramid, but that has been replaced with a more um, user-friendly style called my plate. And so as you can see, it has fruits and protein that are about the same and vegetables and grains that are the two biggest categories. Um, and then you have your dairy on the side. So what this is trying to demonstrate is that in each meal, we should have a balance of the food groups. Instead of having, um, I feel like traditionally protein is the main component of our meals, and we have a little bit of vegetables and a little bit of carbs, um, and sometimes we might have milk with our meal, but really maintaining a balance and making sure high fiber foods have the, the greatest, um, take up the greatest space on our plate, that's going to be the most beneficial. Um, and the my plate guidelines are available on the internet, um, and it gives a lot of examples of the different food groups. So, for example, plant-based proteins, beans, other things that can fit in the protein category that aren't just strictly meat things um, that we normally think of. Also, alternative dairy products, anything like that, yogurt, any kind of milk product. Um, also, the dietary guidelines, which just serve to provide a general healthy eating guide for Americans. Um, so, it's things like increasing physical activity, limiting saturated fat, um, eating a balance of foods combined with physical activity, choosing a variety of foods, making our plates colorful, um, as well as choosing those grain products, fruits and vegetables, those products that are high in fiber that we've discussed, and choosing a diet that's low in saturated fat, in cholesterol, um, and low in fat in general. So out of the three macronutrients, fat has the highest caloric density. So we have our carbs, fats, and protein. Um, and carbs and protein have four calories per gram, whereas fat has nine calories per gram. So that's just something to know and think, okay, for the same amount, let's say one cup of fat versus one cup of carbs, um, the fats are significantly more calorically dense. So um, even just a small portion of a fat product is gonna be extremely high in calories. So anything you can do to cut down in calories it's going to promote weight maintenance. Um, it's going to be great for decreasing strokes because, as we saw, obesity and overweight, that's a risk factor for strokes. Um, also, the dietary guidelines promote a diet that's moderate in sugar um, and moderate in salt and sodium. And there's specific numbers for these that can be accessed online. Um, they do change about every five years. Um, and then if you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. It has seven calories per gram. So it's also even higher than carbs and protein um, as far as caloric density goes. So it's just important to monitor um, the calories in your alcohol because a lot of times it's easy to just drink things and not consider the calories um, and really just not think about the nutrition in your beverages. So dining out guidelines, not that we're doing too much of that recently, like I said, but it's important to watch your portion sizes. Normally, restaurant-style meals are two portions. So split a meal with a friend, um, ask for a to-go box immediately when you receive your plate. Um, when you're ordering, you can ask for a to-go box to be brought out with your meal, um, or you can ask them to go ahead and put half of it in a to-go box. Um, just to make sure you're not sitting there talking with friends and you're kind of full, but you're still slowly just picking away at whatever you're eating uh, just because it's there, it's right in front of you. Um, choose foods that are baked, broiled, or grilled. So again, focusing on those heart-healthy cooking methods, avoiding things that are fried, um, and just doing anything you can to eliminate the amount of saturated fat. 
um, or just fat in general that your food is cooked in. Um, avoiding fried foods, asking for nutritional information. Um, pretty much all restaurants are required to have the nutritional information available. Um, so if you don't see it, if it's not on the menu like it is at a lot of places, you can ask your waiter um, or ask someone as a friend to see if they have the nutrition information. And it's just a good rule of thumb to see what are the lower calorie options. Um, I can find something that I still enjoy that's gonna be slightly lower in calories, maybe lower in sodium. It's really just about being educated, um, selecting the foods that are going to be best, but not um, on a strict diet that we feel miserable on, that we feel like we can't eat anything. Um, and also eat slowly. If you go out to eat with friends, just a good practice is to just put your fork down, which is really difficult if you actually try it. But put your fork down, have a conversation, drink water while you're um, eating your meal. Just take a break from food for a little while, engage in conversation with people, and then pick up your fork and have another bite. Um, focus on chewing and make sure you're chewing your food properly. Really just small little tips to make sure you're um, still enjoying dining out, still enjoying um, eating together with friends and family, but just being as wise as we can. So physical activity, um, this is so important to balance both diet and physical activity. Um, the goal is at least 30 minutes, um, three days per week. And while that might seem difficult, it's just so important to um, find a physical activity that you think is enjoyable. Um, and striving for different accountability partners, whether that's a running group or a gym group, going on runs with your friends or family in a park, that's my favorite activity to do. Just making exercise something that you look forward to. And while it does take up time and everyone's busy, it's such a benefit to your health. Um, it promotes stress relief, long-term weight loss. Um, it increases bone density, so for people with osteoporosis. Um, it improves sleep patterns with that obstructive sleep apnea. It can decrease weight um, and thus can improve sleep. Um, so really, there's so many benefits. And though it does take up time, um, if you find something that you enjoy and have a way to look forward to it, that can be really beneficial for your overall health. Um, and I just wanted to conclude to say that a heart-healthy diet is just simple dietary modifications. It's not meant to be overwhelming. It's not a harsh diet that you cut out a lot of things. It's just meant to be a diet that you can still enjoy the foods that you normally eat. We're just changing them a little bit, and who knows, you might even like grilled fish better than um, fried fish. Um, and it's just one change at a time, so you don't have to implement every single thing I've discussed all at once um, and just completely change the way that you eat. It can just be one thing at a time. Maybe um, next week you go to a restaurant and you look at the nutrition facts, and instead of getting what you normally get, you get something that still sounds appealing that's half the calories. Um, or maybe at a restaurant, you get half of it in a to-go box and take it home and eat it the next day. So it's just one change at a time. Um, and then make goals for yourself and have accountability. Um, maybe tell your spouse or your friend, I'd like to exercise three times per week next week, or maybe even once per week, um, and have them hold you accountable. Maybe they'll text you or email you or call and say, did you work out three times last week? Um, it's so good to have accountability and to make goals for yourself regarding um, not only diet, but also exercise. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope you've come away with some practical tips on how to apply the heart healthy diet. I hope that you understand the process of the stroke better so that you can understand how to prevent it. Thank you so much.